Hi, my name is Addie Stewart, and I'm here with Jesse Stewart, founder of the Phoenix Project. Jesse R. Stewart is the founder of AM300 Solutions, AM300, author, and retired U.S. Army Ranger. Through AM300, he is honored and humbled to develop, collaborate, and deliver hard-fought wisdom to win in life with organizations such as the U.S. Ski and Snowboard National Teams, TEDx, U.S. Olympic Training Center, and numerous other high-performing organizations. Jesse's book, documenting the mission of AM300, The Phoenix Project, Hard Fall Wisdom, The Winning in Life, is scheduled for release in early 2022. His first book, Unwinnable Wars, is an international bestseller and can be found wherever books are sold. Jesse resides in Dallas, Texas, and can be found on all social media platforms at at AM300 Phoenix or contact directly through AM300's website www.am300.com. Oh, so Dad, you retired as an Army Ranger at 31 years old due to being wounded four times in combat. You taught as a university professor after retiring and started AM300 Solutions. How do you find yourself pursuing a doctorate? Yes, yeah, so for me, the, uh, the doctorate program is something that I told myself that I would never do uh, because I did not want to be perceived as chasing a title or uh, anything for any sort of uh, potential uh, position uh, benefits. And so uh, up until now, uh, I've held off on doing that uh, because there's never an opportunity to do research or do study on something that I hold near and dear to my heart, which is the uh, veteran suicide rate. Every day on average 22 veterans commit suicide and that rate has been steady since 2009 when they started tracking. Uh, as you know, I've of course lost several of my uh, rangers from my unit in combat initially, 14 of them under my command, 22 in our task force, uh, but almost that number to suicide since we've come back. Uh, so uh, when that number of suicides matched the number that we lost in Iraq, 14, uh, that's when I decided decided to reshape AM300 into the form that it is now uh, with the mission statement to develop, collaborate, and deliver hard-fought wisdom to win in order to bring together high-performing individuals like Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, uh, professional athletes, U.S. skiers, snowboarders, et cetera, so that way uh, veterans can still see their value. And because in my opinion, it was uh, that people did not feel like anyone cared about our military service anymore. Don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, I think most civilians do care. I think that they just aren't aware of the struggles that veterans go through. Uh, so uh, at Baylor, uh, they gave me an opportunity to uh, address a problem statement and that problem uh, practice that I'm developing or focused on is on veteran suicide. Now, obviously 22 veterans a day committing suicide. There's on average 95 suicides a day in the United States. Uh, that means that 25% of the suicides in the United States are from veterans. That veteran population that makes up most of those suicides comes from 1% of the U.S. population. So it's obviously, it, it is astronomically misrepresented. So the problem of practice, obviously the problem is veteran suicide, but I'm more interested in what is the problem that is causing veterans to get to that point. Because prior to 2008 or 2009, veterans always had a lower suicide rate than their civilian counterparts. It's all sudden switched and changed over. And through this problem practice, one of, some of the things that I've found, and I'll go over in the evidence, is that uh, this is the first war that's been fought where there's no draft, where not everybody had to go. Guys like Daddy went uh, sometimes 14, 20, 25 times while no one else had to go. And so that's the first thing. We were the only ones that went and fought, and that can create seeds of resentment that when you go back into civilian society, you manifest the other part, because it's the longest war our country's ever fought, almost 20 years. Again, without a draft. So what that's created is a gap between military veterans and civilians that may not be real, but it's there and it's perceived and it's created this perception by veterans that there's no way back to civilian society, which I know when I got out of the military in 2012 and you were three years old, four years old, all I wanted to do was come back and be a civilian. So this problem of practice is originated and targeted towards finding out the why and and hope to later down the road putting application and resources to addressing that why uh, to try and bring down the number of suicides. So, Father, so Dad, you first talked about um, veteran suicide and how many veterans commit suicide on average.
here today. And can you talk about your research thus so far? What is it telling you up until this point? Yes, yeah, so the research thus far has been very frustrating because the people that hold that research or hold those, a lot of that data is where most veterans go for their military or uh, healthcare, which is the VA. Uh, VA is a government organization, great people that work there, however, it's still government, so there's going to be red tape, it's going to be slow, there's going to be the inherent uh, protecting of jobs, etc. So the data is there, it's just tough to find. Uh, for this research project, I focused on five specific articles that I used. Um, first one is uh, by Hogan, and it's a study that discusses um, or it looks at uh, acknowledging the great efforts that the VA has made, but acknowledging that there are shotgun blasts across all veterans, where if you're trying to target a veteran that is suffering from suicidal ideologies leading to a suicide attempt, you need to have targeted uh, therapy or targeted programs that can actually get to him or her so you actually reach them. A second source uh, was by Cy, and uh, in that article, uh, he is assessing the actual involvement and willingness of veterans to even pursue and be a part of uh, programs. Uh, the research found that 72 percent, again, as Hogan's article said, are aware of programs out there, but only five percent of them actually use them. So uh, it's frustrating as a taxpayer that if you're paying a lot of tax money for a great program and no one's using it, that it goes unused, and it's not. Third article by Kachadurian, uh, titled Protective Correlations of Suicidal, Suicidality uh, Amongst Veterans, is an interesting article. And this article focuses on, rather than finding out what the risk factors are for veteran suicide, which is something that a ton of research has been done on, uh, fortunately not effectively yet, uh, but what has not been have research on is what are the behaviors that veterans that do have suicidal ideations, meaning they think about it, but they never get to the suicide attempt. So are there a common set of protective traits that that veteran has or those veterans have that can be identified and then perhaps taught to other veterans? Construction fourth article is by Basart. And his article uh, titled Veteran Suicide Prevention, Emerging Priorities and Opportunities uh, for Intervention. That was really one of the first articles that came out in uh, 2010, it was published that identified the change in veteran suicide versus civilian rate. You said up until uh, The fifth article uh, that I looked at was by um, Holler, and Hugh, and Hendricks, and it was focused on reintegration stress, which I'm sure is something you can probably appreciate from your dad. That one's titled, Does Reintegration Stress Contribute? Reintegration Stress Contribute to Suicidal Ideation Amongst Returning Veterans with PTSD. Now, when VA goes in to treat veterans, they're looking for veterans with PTSD to be able to treat, but never has there been any sort of focus on what are the stressors that goes from being an Army Ranger one day, all of a sudden being a civilian the next day, and going between those two different worlds. And I know when Daddy got out of the military, when I got out of the military, I was expected that I would just easily flow into civilian life because I was an officer, because I was a Ranger, etc. And so I know that I didn't feel that I could necessarily ask for help or reintegration training or anything like that because uh, I didn't want to make people feel out of place or whatever. So uh, Holler's article is uh, important and very relevant. I think there's a lot of future application in studying that. So that is the initial research and the evidence that I have clearly articulates. There is a problem of, yes, veteran suicide, but there are underlying problems that are not being addressed, that perhaps that overarching problem is mudding the waters to the point that why we're not making any progress and putting a dent in this 22 a day. Okay, we've discussed veteran suicide and some underlying problems that contribute to it. And now I would like to ask, in your hard work with M300 and professional athletes and veterans, you are known for advocating certain principles of hard-fought wisdom. Can you talk about those? Yes, so this class is interesting and this is series of instruction and courses that are interesting because uh, through our mission statement of AM300, which is to develop, collaborate, and deliver hard fought wisdom to win at life, while in that mission statement, there's not words like grit, mindset, motivational principles, goal theory, etc. Those things are all kind of implied within our, our, our work. And so this, uh, this information has been extremely exciting and I believe there is tremendous application. Uh, I picked five of the principles of learning the focus on principles slash theories, uh, all of them are relevant uh, to advocating or addressing veteran suicide, but here are the top five that I felt were most important. 
Uh, first one is grit theory. Uh, so grit theory uh, suggests that success is actually determined by non-conventional means. Uh, factors such as passion, perseverance, learning, and willingness to embrace failure. Where normal uh, success is normally based off of, you know, your genetics, how smart you are, what your IQ is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this theory was brought forth by Angela Duckworth, an uh, amazing uh, physician, psychologist, school teacher, mathematician, and the woman I think has three PhDs. And she went through her research and she found tangibly through the data that, that talent was not what necessarily got you to win. It was this level of perseverance and grit and willingness to embrace suffering that ultimately won out uh, within the top performers. So that's great theory by uh, Angela Duckworth and she was the one that kind of coined uh, applicable concept slash theory is uh, an old good goodie, transformational learning. And uh, transformational learning, uh, which was brought around by Mesro in 1978, uh, is essentially uh, finding extreme ownership of one's process throughout the entire life. So Daddy always talked about owning his trauma, owning what he went through. Uh, Mesro's uh, theory of transformational learning um, has evolved in respect and take hold that uh, basically allows someone, even if they have trauma in their life, to figure out a way to make that part of their, uh, their process. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my personal connection to that in the next section, but that's transformational learning. Uh, his theory, he refined uh, at least once, I know, and several others have continued to make spinoffs, but the premise of it is extreme ownership of life circumstances, using them as building blocks in order to transform and create better. Uh, third theory is uh, theory of margin, which is theory of margin was brought forth by McCluskey in 1963. Um, he uh, had this theory, the power of load margin, that Margin is calculated essentially dividing the load by the power of obtained. Anything less than one, meaning if your load is more than the power that you have, you're going to crumble or you're going to break, uh, either physically or mentally. And so the theory of margin suggests you can predict where someone will fail uh, within whatever it is that they're doing. And so once you understand a person, you can understand what their capacity is. Uh, and then you can uh, know where to maybe stop, how much work you get them, or where you can give them more, uh, is goal theory. And Schunk, 2012, described goal theory uh, as for the purpose of learner's engagement in a results-based learning environment. Uh, you know, there's two different types of goals. There's performance goals, and there's master goals. Uh, master goals are what guides you on your life. That's what gives you your purpose. Performance goals are like, I'm gonna do this in order to get past this. I'm gonna clean my room so I can get this. Master will be, I'm gonna run 10 miles today so that way I can run 11 next week. Uh, so goal theory and understanding it can definitely assist in, uh, in identifying where points of failure are so you can mitigate where they're gonna happen and then plan for them and be able to hit your goals and your check blocks or your checkpoints along the uh, uh, principle, uh, which no surprise is mindset. And mindset, uh, as far as the class is concerned, uh, was made famous and brought forth by Angelo in 2017. He used uh, John Keller's MVP, MVP RCD model, attention, relevance, confidence, satisfaction, volition, uh, to establish a framework to essentially provide an assessment of where one is and identify where their mindset is. And there's two types of mindsets generally as identified by both Keller and uh, Angelo, and that's fixed and growth. Fixed is you just you have what you got, you got your lot in life, and that's all there is. Growth is I can do anything that I put my mind to, I can do the hard work, I can uh, put in the hours, nothing is impossible. Possible is nothing, nothing is impossible. Uh, so those are the five theories, uh, such principles that I chose to focus on. All five of them, I believe, have very specific application uh, in terms of addressing the problem of practice that I'm talking about, which is better suicide. And I believe they've already had, and I think you can probably go back and look at the work that you're familiar with me, quite a bit of application of these principles in AMP parents work already. In the past question, you briefly talked about five concepts with the, um, related to your mind that help contribute to veteran suicide and that aspect. And I think I've seen you apply pretty much all of those with the athletes and the veterans that you work with. Can you give me some? Can you give some examples of the application of those principles? 
Yeah, so the mission statement at AM300, as we talked earlier, is to develop, collaborate, and deliver hard fought wisdom to win uh, in life across mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual plans of existence. Uh, the hard fought wisdom that makes AM300 an attractive option for some of the athletes that you've met, like Lucas Foster, uh, Josh Bowman, is uh, that our practice is grounded in the application of principles defined uh, in the section above. Uh, I mean, these concepts are applied to help them push limits if their coaches are unable to push them through. That only someone has been through Ranger School for 61 days, or Buds, maybe SEAL School, through six months, or through the extreme uh, situations of combat can fully understand in order to get them to where they want to go. Uh, so, with that being said, the application that we've been able to do with the athletes so far and bringing in veterans to come help do that, not just dad, and not just me, uh, shows that. There is a role here for providing continued service uh, from what we went through. And with, it seems like probably if this gap is what's causing uh, this veteran suicide epidemic, then bring in special operators, bring in other veterans to help professional athletes reach new levels shows a validation uh, of their military service. So if you can turn around and put a target effort of those principles and applications specifically towards veterans, uh, I think it has tremendous potential uh, for impact. So I'll quickly go over each one and just talk about uh, those instances and I'll skip to grit uh, and hit that one. So as far as transfer, transformational learning, I mean, it's a common thing connecting the work. It's a fabric uh, within the tenets of transformational learning uh, because of our emphasis of process of results. You hear me talk about it all the time. That focus on the process, the victory is in the process, not the finish line. The finish line will come, the victory will come, the medals will become as simply as a natural act that just happens as getting up and going to the bathroom in the morning. Uh, the process is what it's all about. And transformational learning uh, is you know, an enhanced level of one's uh, ability uh, according to uh, Mesut in 2000. And so if you can turn that inward and turn the competition inward, uh, that's where people are gonna start breaking through and that's where we've been able to use it with athletes. I know uh, for myself, uh, with my experience and with other veterans that I encourage is, is taking ownership of my process, taking ownership of my trauma, what I went through and realizing uh, that, you know, I was or am still a damaged I'm damaged and flawed beyond repair because of the military service that I chose to do for a country, as an Army Ranger, for being wounded four times, for the surgeries that I had to go through, and experiencing the death that I did. I am damaged and flawed beyond repair of what I originally was. Now, to most people, yeah, that sucks. You know, let's end things right there or go and hide and never come back out again. For me, I look at that like the Michelangelo statue of uh, David, which originally was supposed to be something completely different. It was a big piece of rock. It was supposed to be something so much bigger, but it had a fault line across the middle of it when the emperor went to inspect it prior to its commissioning. And so the emperor said, throw this out. Michelangelo, having personally harvested the rock, kept it and hid it and started working on it, not knowing what it was going to become. He didn't know how much the rock was actually going to work with. He worked around the damage and flaws, and out of it became what is known as the ideal man in all of history. So the ideal man, according to artists all over the world, as a result of a damaged and flawed piece of marble. Uh, so transformational learning. Okay, moving on, uh, theory of margin. Uh, so theory of margin, we talked about the power load uh, concepts. Uh, with the athletes that we work with, it's absolutely critical to understand what their current capacity is. And if you can understand what their current capacity is, then you can work to help them train past it. And so the theory of margin and power load, uh, in terms of applying towards athletes, that's where we use it, towards veterans, it's where you find out how hard you can push a guy in order to get to the deepest and darkest uh, traumatic events uh, where you need to pull back, where they can go harder um, you know, with a veteran, teaching them that, hey, this, this mindset that you have of being able to go and go and go is something that provides value to civilians that they're gonna run and learn and learn and hear about. And so theory margin, uh, definitely an application. Uh, the next one, goal theory. Uh, you know, people do not become high performers by simply sitting around and doing random tasks very, very well. They do tasks in a strategic and targeted way that ensure that they're pursuing mastery, all right? You started to experience that a little bit with your running, 
but everything that you do has intention. Every goal that you set as part of a bigger goal is gonna get you to that next level and gonna get you to that next prize. Uh, next one is mindset. Uh, mindset, uh, we talked about earlier uh, from Angelo. Uh, mindset is one of the things that I believe ties all of this stuff together because once you have the elements of grit, once you have uh, theory of margin understood, once you have goal theory uh, set in line, that mindset of I am not forced into a box, I can recover, I can heal, I can do anything that I want, I can do anything I need for myself, for my daughters, for my family, whatever, that mindset aspect is what's going to ultimately get us across the finish line. So take that into account of you know, the growth versus fixed mindset. A veteran has a mindset that is in the gutter in terms of risk for suicide. Well, it's already been proven through Angela's work. Their mindsets can be shifted, can be adjusted. And so it's just about teaching veterans, and we do it with athletes all the time. Uh, let's look at mindset. Up until a few days ago, you probably didn't think that you could run eight miles straight in an 824 total overall pace after having just set a 3.1 uh, mile or 5K personal record but you broke through it, right? That clearly shows you have a natural growth mindset in you. It also shows that you have the final, and what I believe to be one of the most critical uh, elements within this instruction, and that's the theory of grit, or grit theory. Uh, grit theory is what I can say got me through everything since the time that I was a kid. And I can tell you that there's no way that I should experience the success that I did in the military, uh, but the, through the application of grit, through the application of perseverance, through the application of never quitting, through the application of, okay, yeah, I just ran past the race sign that I was supposed to turn on, but now I'm gone, and I don't know how long I'm gonna go. That's ranger school for 61 days. So the concept of grit is in something that's been ingrained in me since I was a young boy. Not necessarily the easiest thing to teach because it is about a relationship with suffering. In terms of current application, though, I can say that I've seen some amazing athletes do some amazing things with the USD and snowboard team and other NGBs, national governing bodies at the Olympics. But it's tough to try and put those athletes in situations where you can help push them to achieve that level of grit, to build on it, and to have more to be able to achieve more the next time. It's almost impossible to put people in those situations. But last Thursday, I watched you in an impossible situation where you somehow got from running a 5K to being stuck on an eight mile course where you had a choice that I think 99.999% of people in the world would have made, which is stop, either turn around, sit on the sidewalk and wait for someone from race sport to come get you, or sit there and cry and just be pissed or angry or whatever. Instead, you chose to keep going forward. You chose to break through those barriers. That is the ultimate display of grit. And it's proven in the data that talent plus grit, which you have talent clearly with your running, but that grit is what separates the best athletes in the world. And I got to see it manifest right in front of me. And granted, it put me in a 40 minute state of terror thinking that I had lost my daughter, but it uh, ultimately in the end, you were able to cross a Rubicon in your life for you to be able to understand you truly have no limits and you can do whatever you want. Uh, and it was pretty inspiring to me. So to watch my own daughter manifest these principles right in front of me was pretty freaking amazing. So that is, uh, that is my summary on the principles of learning. Uh, there are awesome principles that I think provide uh, pretty serious application towards veteran suicide. They provide serious application in my current work with uh, high performing athletes. Uh, and all that I've ever wanted is to figure out a way that I could teach those principles to you and your sister but not jam up that your throat because I know that that would cause you guys to just run away from us. And I've tried to be very careful over the past several years that I don't do that. And to watch you just go out there and instinctively go and do what I've been trying to teach you this whole time was one of the most impactful things that I've ever seen. And I can honestly say watching you run that race was more entertaining than any snowboard half pipe event that I ever saw, including Lucas, Sean White, JJ, C9 on the Alpine. And uh, it was pretty awesome. So I look forward to watching you continue to apply these principles 
that clearly you get, you understand, and you've already developed a level of competency that most people will never achieve. So I'm proud of you, and thanks for inspiring me. Thank you for coming into the show, Lucy. And now, this is the conclusion of the end.